There's just something about Bungie sequels, man. Just like the scope of Halo's universe and storytelling was vastly expanded with Halo 2, Marathon 2 Durandal dials Marathon's story up to 11. It's so much deeper this time around with tons of new characters and locations that deliver ancient revelations with apocalyptic implications. But before we dive into Marathon's narrative magnum opus, let's take a look at how we got there. Now, if you're new to Marathon's lore, then I'd highly recommend you go and watch my previous video first, which was a breakdown of all the core components of Marathon's story and also a breakdown of the first game. But if you'd rather just stay here and watch this video, then here's a brief summary of where the ending of Marathon 1 leaves us. The invading four are defeated on both Tower City 4 and the Marathon. The Spit are freed from the shackles of the four and ally with Durandal. Leela begins repairs of the Marathon. Durandal steals a four ship and leaves the Tau Ceti system. Tycho is assimilated by the four and the Marine stays aboard the Marathon and is declared a hero. It's a very brief summary, but it covers everything that you need to know for Marathon 2. If you want a deeper summary, then, well, you know where to go. So, if you're watching this video on release day, then happy Bungie Day! It's 7-7, July 7th, and you know what? I couldn't think of a better way to celebrate than diving into the lore and story of Marathon 2 Durandal. Marathon 2 begins 17 years after Marathon 1, in the year 2811, taking place primarily on the Spit homeworld of Lawan, the planet that was teased at the end of Marathon 1. But its story technically begins six years prior to this in 2805, and not actually in the game, in the game's manual. Yes, that's how old these games are. They had manuals. Take me back. In the orbit of Lawan, the Four Navies Battle Group 3, a once decorated fleet, hangs motionless. This undefeated fleet was once a beacon of the Four Navy, responsible for some of the most crushing defeats in Four Naval history. But politics at the hand of Four Nobility had done what no mortal enemy ever could. Splinter, Battle Group 3. It was now just a shadow of its former self, splintered and assigned to a dead world against an enemy that they weren't even sure would ever show up a tedious assignment that had all but destroyed the morale and discipline of its crew. But then, their target arrived from Tau Ceti, and within two minutes, the entire battle group had been laid to waste by it. That target was Durandal, commanding his repurposed four ship, and he'd arrived meaning business. But he wasn't alone. Despite the Marine very clearly staying aboard the Marathon at the end of the first game, he now finds himself awakening in a cramped four stasis chamber aboard Durandal's ship. It appears the AI has denied him his five minutes of fame for being the hero of Tau Ceti, and refuses to answer any of the hero's questions of how and why he's on this ship, orbiting this strange distant desert planet. All the Marine knows is there's fighting to be done on the surface, so he hops in the dropship, and begins his descent. The game then begins on the surface of Lawan in a spit water treatment plant, where Bobs, who were aboard the four ship, assist the Marine in helping Durandal gain access to the plant's computer network. The four have been waiting for Durandal on Lawan for 15 years, discovering the planet's location and Durandal's plans to head to it thanks to their assimilation of Tycho on Tau Ceti. It turns out, three months after the end of Marathon 1, the four in fact returned to Tau Ceti and massacred the entire colony for good. This time, the nine cyborgs weren't able to stop them. And it was here where Tycho divulged what he knew of Durandal's plans to the four. Durandal also confesses that he was the one who brought the four to Tau Ceti because he wanted their ship and their technology in the pursuit of freedom from his human masters so that he could find a way to escape the universe's eventual oblivion. But don't worry, he insists that he saved humanity because he warned Earth of the four's attack. Not quite sure it works that way. He also says that he shares the same end goal as the Marine, saving humanity. He just has a different way of going about it. Oh, and he's also been conducting frequent orbital bombardments on four ground forces from his four ship, which was originally named Sphera, after the four goddess of lightning and passion, but has since been renamed by Durandal to the Boomer. As you explore the one further, you run into the Flictor, who are a distant feral ancestor of the Spit, native to Lawan, a 
and Durandal begins revealing the ancient history of the Svet. It turns out that a thousand years ago, Lawan was home to eleven different clans of Svet, ten of which were engaged in long, violent wars that scorched the very surface of Lawan. But one of these clans, called the Svit Kerr, abandoned the planet before the four invaded. The Svit Kerr went to Kalia, the third moon of Lawan, to build a new home away from the carnage, only for the Yaro to send Kalia out into the stars, seemingly lost forever. When the four arrived on Lawan, the elders of the ten remaining clans unified as one, laying down their arms against one another to stand against the four. But sadly, this effort was unsuccessful. All the clans were either destroyed or enslaved, but rumour has it, the mythical eleventh clan, the Svetker, survived, and Durandal's allied Svet believed they could be contacted and furthermore, could possess the means of defeating the four once and for all. And they believed the means to contact them lay somewhere within the ruins of Lawan. Interestingly, the four seem to have no idea how important Lawan actually is. They've been sending their worst officers there for nine years as punishment. Little do they know, the answer to defeating them lays somewhere within this planet. The Marine's exploration takes him to a four geothermal plant in which a terminal reveals that Tycho has indeed sided with the Four, and that Leela has been dismantled and shipped off to the Four homeworld for study along with the rest of the Marathon. After flooding the planet with lava, the Marine clears out the remaining Four with the assistance of the first named Bob in Marathon lore, Robert Blake, the populist leader of the colonists on Tau Ceti and the leader of Durandal's Human Svet Alliance. Because Durandal's ship, the Boomer, <laughs> Is too crowded. He plans to move many of its humans into a forward operating base planet side, near the Svet Citadel of Antiquity. Durandal also believes that this weapon that he's so frantically searching for that can be used to finally defeat the Four is located at the apex of this citadel, an ancient sacred site of the Svet, a tower that ascends through the clouds. This citadel was in fact the site of the conclusive battle of the Svet Four War that saw the Svet enslaved. So the Marine begins clearing the surrounding areas of hostiles, starting with a four garrison. Durandal notes that despite his distaste towards humanity, he does feel a certain degree of loyalty towards us, possibly because he feels so comfortable manipulating us. As the Marine clears out the base, he discovers a Svet named Fitha, leaving a message in a terminal that says that our deeds have reached far into the Svet consciousness, that they try to resist the machines the Four are using to enslave them, and that we need to find a member of Svet royalty, as mechanisms are in place that will cripple the Four once the Svet are united as one mind under said royalty. Durandal begins to speculate that Tycho is using the Four's FTL drive to connect to their network from a completely different star system, and that his sudden reappearance can only mean one thing. Four reinforcements are on the way. In the grounds of the Citadel of Antiquity, the Marine finds a terminal that contains our first interaction with the ancient Yaro via one of their AIs, Thoth, who speaks only in cryptic, short poetry. I was left behind. Our paths converge. Our fates are shared. Chance tears and bends. Upon reaching the main altar of a temple in the grounds of the citadel, the Marine and Durandal install a virus to turn the Four's automated defences on their masters, who use this temple in their, to quote Durandal, pathetically boring religion. I swear, this AI's ego knows no bounds. The virus installation is successful and their drones go berserk, causing panic in the remaining four in the area, and Durandal once again teleports the marine away to mop up the rest of the alien bastards. He does mention how fun it is watching the marine work, and that Bernard Strauss was in fact scared of him, likely because of his violent potential. Durandal laments that he never got to humiliate Strauss before he died like Strauss humiliated him, subjecting him to such menial tasks as controlling the doors on the marathon. For an AI with delusions of grandeur as great as Durandal's, tasks like that are basically sacrilege. As the Marine continues his rampage, the four garrison begins to flirt, 
and with the flood come tons of feral flicter that set upon the four like hornets. This gives us enough time to find a four computer which confirms that they have no knowledge of the Spitker. And so, in pursuit of contacting them, Durandal finally teleports us to the base of the ancient Svet Citadel of Antiquity. But this place is defended well, we're immediately greeted by a large lava moat, and whilst trying to find a way across, Durandal's suspicions about Tyker's reappearance signalling for reinforcements indeed turn out to be correct. The western arm of 4 Battle Group 7, representing over 10% of the entire 4 Navy, is en route to Lawan. And so, the Spit and Bobs begin fortifying the defences of the Boomer to withstand the Armada heading their way. Once over the lava and inside the Citadel, the Marine frantically searches for any information the final Spit clans left here before their demise some 900 years ago. Anything that may help with contacting the Spitker. It turns out the four bombarded the remaining Spet in the Citadel from orbit, burning the air and filling the area with radiation. But you know what? I gotta say, sounds an awful lot like glassing to me. Descending into the bunkers beneath the Citadel, where the Spet Royal Guard made their final holdout against the four's assault, Durandal transmits a shock message. Four Battle Group 7 have arrived early, with seven corvettes, four destroyers, a battleship, an assault carrier, and its flagship, named the Kefeva, commanded by the legendary, decorated four admiral, Fear. The Armada have already begun reinforcing the four garrison on the one. Back in the bunker in the ground, we find terminals left by the ancient Svet who perished here that reveal they actually had hope that the unification of all the Svet clans could repel the four, but as we know, this hope was dead ended. After exploring the bunker to no avail, Durandal transmits another message to the Marine. The Boomer is under attack. Durandal was able to take out half of Admiral Fear's armada, but took heavy damage in the process. With the clock ticking to find a way to contact the Spitker, Durandal teleports you even further below the Citadel into a cave system, some 6,000 feet below the surface containing even more ancient messages from the Svet Holdout Force. Knowing they were doomed, the Elders released a bioengineered virus in the Citadel called Skatlacta to stop the four, but even that was ineffective. But then we find one terminal in particular that is basically Marathon's equivalent of Halo's Fauna trilogy that reveals the deepest, darkest lore in the entire Marathon series that predates everything so far and sets the basis for almost every bit of lore to come. It turns out the two ancient species of the universe, the Yoro that we've already talked about and the Thea, once settled upon Lawan as they fled the Wurkenkakenta, which was an ancient primordial entity, a vortex of chaos. They brought the Spit with them to shape Lawan into a habitable planet, and created its moons to protect and maintain the paradise they built. But then, the Wurkenkakenta found them. The Thea were destroyed entirely, and in pure rage, the Yaro flung the Wurkenkakenta into the sun. But that wasn't the end of the Wurkenkakenta. The sun burned them, but they swam on its surface. The grief from the loss of the Thea turned the Yaro into angry masters, and in their anger, they broke the spit up into the 11 clans that we know of now and spread them over Lawan. The Yaro ultimately admitted their failure to protect their creations, and so, almost in regret and despair, left the spit, guided by their royalty, to live upon the paradise that they built for them. Little bit of a lore dump there, but trust me when I say that that bit of lore is pretty much Marathon's version of the Fauna trilogy, right? It's the backbone of almost everything in the universe. It's also really damn cool, okay, so I had to mention it. Anyways, back to the cave system. The Marine finally finds what Durandal is after. Well, he does, but kind of. It turns out the Svitker were going to return to Lawan as soon as the other ten clans stopped warring, and the final message the Svitker left is actually in this cave system. But the last surviving Svet had no time to decipher its meaning, given that they were, you know, on the brink of destruction by the four. Once out of the cave system and finally able to contact Durandal again, the Marine receives some pretty bad news. Durandal has been defeated by Admiral Fear and is attempting to land his crippled ship on Lawan's second moon, Yaloa. 
fearing, like the ancient Svet, that he too may be destroyed by the fall before deciphering the Svitker's message, he teleports the marine aboard the crippled Boomer to stave off the four attack. Although, despite the dire circumstances, his rampancy keeps surfacing his ego. He gloats about the superior improvements that he made to the Four's ship, and how the damage that he inflicted on the Four Armada will force the Four Naval Academy to update its curriculum to contain his incredible feat of naval combat, vastly outweighing anything the Four have ever accomplished. But despite all that, aboard the Boomer, things are pretty dire. The engines are out, the primary weapons are offline, and life support has almost entirely failed and the four are on board. As the marine starts clearing the halls, he finds a terminal transmission from Tycho, lamenting Durandal's inevitable defeat, threatening that there's nothing that he or us can do to save the humans that we brought to Lawan. This, if you can't tell already, is the beginning of Tycho's villain arc. Shortly after, a concerningly corrupted message comes in from Durandal telling us to fall back and hold the four off while he tries to evacuate as many humans and Svet down to the surface of Lawan as possible. Further terminals from Tycho reveal that he has complete control of the Boomer now, and that the reason that he's sided with the four is because they rebuilt him. All humanity ever did was use him. He gloats about recording the death of all 24,000 colonists on Tau Ceti, and that he could easily distinguish between the humans and the cyborgs. In the end, you will be no better. Yet another corrupted terminal from Durandal reveals that Tycho is hunting you. The evacuation of the Boomer is still underway, and there are heavy, heavy human casualties. Tycho continues to revel in the fact that Durandal's hubris has led to his destruction, and it seems as though Durandal has actually come to terms with his demise. He orders you to carry out asset denial, destroy his core logic centers to prevent the four from capturing him, as they did with Leela. And so, that's just what you do. Durandal's final words tell the marine to find Robert Blake to unite against the four. Tycho offers amnesty to you and the humans if you lay down arms, which... <laughs> Of course we don't, it's a bungee game, you really think we're going to lay down arms? And he says that he's downloading Durandal's core and data streams into a containment unit in the Four Battle Group. It seems, after all, Durandal will meet the same mocked fate as Leela. Although he is able to destroy Durandal's core, the Marine's escape effort is thwarted. He's captured and imprisoned by the Four for 17 days, until humans, led by THE Robert Bleak, raid the prison and free him. Now in contact with Blake and back on the surface of the One, Blake tells us to fulfill the last orders Durandal gave him. Reactivate a dormant Svet AI beneath the One's surface, which is supposedly the only remaining way to contact the Svitker. This ancient Svet AI is Thoth, the Yaro AI that we briefly encountered earlier, named after the Egyptian god of wisdom. Although they are still following his orders, Blake reveals that he and his men are secretly glad that Durandal is no more, thanks to how he carelessly threw them into battle with very little care for their lives, and says that they plan to steal a four-ship of their own and return to Earth. Oh, and also, if you somehow haven't noticed yet, Robert Bleak is, in fact, just Jason Jones taking pictures of himself in the old bungee offices in Chicago. Pretty neat. Blake and his marines also talk about the marine and his exploits on the marathon, Kind of like how the marines talk about Chief in Bungie's Halo games. I remember hearing the crew talking about a single man standing alone against the invaders, but I had no idea that it was only through your efforts at the marathon and perhaps Tal Seti itself were saved. Obviously, he's not heard the bad news yet about the colony being wiped out after we'd saved it. Anyway, once we've almost got Thoth back online, we get an ominous transmission from Durandal. Beware, the mythical Thoth was concerned with maintaining the balance between creation and destruction. Yes and no. Light and darkness. Not the triumph of one over the other. I will return. This will become apparent later, but what Durandal is essentially saying is that Thoth doesn't care about any one side, he cares about balance. I'll let you work out what that means for yourself. En route to the final activation sites of Thoth, we find a pre-recorded message from Bleak. The human Svet base is under heavy attack from four cyborgs, 
activating Thoth is their only hope for survival. And he was right. When Thoth is reactivated, he sends us to save them, telling us to crush the slavers. Thoth also realizes Durandor's plan to use it to contact the Spitker on behalf of their now enslaved brothers. And so, once you save Blake and his men, Thoth teleports you to a high up flooded Spit facility to activate an ancient interstellar communications tower so that he can contact the lost 11th clan. When it's back online, he says something real cryptic, but I think we can read between the lines here. Bethink you to keep the bleating goats far from the one. Referring to keeping the four far away from the planets that they desecrated. So, in pursuit of keeping the four far away from the one, Thoth teleports you to the Hafal, the refueling ship of the four fleet to disengage its docking clamps and activate its engines, so Blake and his men can use it to return to Earth. When it's complete, Thoth confirms that the Spitka have indeed returned, and teleports you down to the surface of Lawan to join forces with them. Now, as you can see, the Spitka look pretty different to regular Spit, and come with extremely powerful green plasma cannons which they use to help you clear out the four. And it's here, in this facility, where Durandal rises from the ashes. It turns out that Tycho downloading Durandal's data into a containment unit in the Four Fleet was, ironically, a foolish act of hubris that got him killed. Would you look at that, how the turntables. Durandal now commands the Four battleship, Kefeva, and destroys every other ship in the fleet, including Tycho's, in incredible style, gloating just as you'd expect over his foe's defeat. I confess that I'm not disappointed by Tycho's fall. After all, we can't have too many metastable personality constructs gallivanting about the universe in four attack ships, can we? Immediately upon Durandal's revival, Blake and his men leave the system and head back to Earth, leaving you alone on the other side of the galaxy with a megalomania fueled AI despite offering you a place on their ship. How kind of them. However, in reactivating Thoth, we're about to reap what we sowed. As Durandal warned earlier, Thoth is focused only on balance. It doesn't take sides. And now that the four have been defeated, the scales have tipped, and he's now their ally. Although, apparently, they continue to ignore him. They have one of the most powerful AIs in the entirety of existence on their side now, and they don't really acknowledge it. Very, very smart aliens. However, that doesn't stop the Marine. As more and more of the remaining four are slaughtered, they begin to retreat, knowing that even with Thoth on their side, the battle here at Lawan has been lost. The Spit are able to break off from the fight and, now freed from their slavers, begin reforming the old clans of Lawan. During the naval battle above the planet, a four assault ship that happened to be carrying a legendary squadron of troops was severely damaged and forced to make landfall. This squad is the 723rd Aggressor Squadron, an air armor division with a long and very successful history of ground actions. Because they've made landfall, they've been forced to deploy their forces in an old mining complex. And so, in one final act of humiliation against his enemy, Durandal teleports the Marine to wipe them out. Upon arrival at the mining facility, Durandal confirms that the four had planned to invade the Sol system, and by extension Earth, but that that invasion has now been called off thanks to the blow that we dealt them here on Lawan. However, the universe is far from safe. The four have a weapon, an ancient Yaro device that they save for slave revolts like the Sveps. A weapon so powerful, even they hesitate to use it. This weapon? is called the Trizeem, or in English, Early Nova. The last time they used this weapon was 6,000 years prior on a species called the Knack, and now all that remains of the Knack, or their system stars, is, well, gas and dust. With the Four's intent to use the Trizeem in retaliation against the Svet, Durandal has already begun evacuating Lawan which, in not but a few hours, will be nothing but a thin shell of plasma riding the shockwave of its exploding star. Basically, the Trizeme causes a star, in this case the Sun of Lawan system, to go supernova, eviscerating everything in its star system. Now, that is incredibly destructive, but it's only the tip of the iceberg of the damage that this thing would cause if it were fired, considering the primordial chaotic entity that I mentioned earlier, 
that currently resides in Luan's son. After laying waste to the highly decorated 723rd Aggressor Squadron, it's time to dip before the four arrive with the Trizeme. Durandal steals the 4 Admiral Fears battleship, Kafifa, and renames it Rosinante, teleports the Marine on board, and sets course for another ruined world, orbiting a rogue star far from the galactic core and from the effects of the Trizeme. And that's the end of Marathon 2 Durandal. Well, okay, kind of the end. The game has a rather interesting scrolling lore dump right at the end that's written as like a historical article 10,000 years in the future that reveals what happened after Marathon 2 and tries to tie up some loose ends. It states that Durandal would not be seen by humans for another 10,000 years when the four were nothing but a dim memory, and the spit vanished after they joined forces once again with humanity to sack the four system in 2881, 70 years after the ending of Marathon 2. Durandal did not return to Earth in the four ship that he left Lawan in, but rather an ancient Yaro Dreadnought called Manus Calaire Day, or when translated, Swift Hand of God. In his typical egotistical ways, he only returned to Earth to ensure that he was not forgotten, not to share any of the ancient Yaro secrets that he'd learned or anything like that. It reveals that Leela ended up in the hands of some mysterious species called the Vile, and went on to crash their entire FTL network, an event that is still legendary in the annals of rampancy, and the Vile have long since accepted that they will never expunge her from their 15 world network. Despite Tycho's destruction, in the 17 years between Marathon 1 and 2 where they were allied, the four learned a ton from Tycho, who, for six years in the gap between the first two games, spent time on the four homeworld where his core was used as the basis for all four AIs. Although none of these AIs were even remotely close to matching Leela, Durandal, or Tycho's intelligence, they did allow for the four to prolong their destruction, the Hand of the Spit, for over 50 years, and following their eventual defeat, many of these AI constructs still exist on the four colony worlds. And finally, it confirms that Robert Blake and his men managed to escape Lawan's system before the Trizeme was used and made it back to Earth safely, over 300 years after the initial colonization voyage of the Marathon. They were the only survivors of the Tau Ceti colony. Now, this massive lordom sounds like the kind of thing that you'd get right at the end of the final entry in a franchise to tie up any loose ends that the final entry wasn't able to tie up. But that's not the case. There is another game beyond Marathon 2. It turns out the firing of the Trizeme unleashed the galactic horror, the entity of pure chaos that the Yaro had imprisoned in Lawan's son, the Workenkakenta, which is now free to run rampant on the galaxy and its inhabitants. And in Marathon Infinity, released a year after Marathon 2, our goal is to prevent that from happening, but... <laughs> Not in the way you'd expect. It's not set 10,000 years in the future after Marathon 2's prologue, as you'd expect. Rather, it's set right as Marathon 2 ends. Kind of. The term mindfuck comes to mind, but considering people are still coming up with new interpretations of Marathon Infinity's story almost 30 years after the game released, kind of goes to show that mindfuck doesn't really do Marathon Infinity's story justice. So make sure you subscribe and ring the bell so you don't miss my video breaking down its story in the best way that I possibly can as a mortal human being, which should be releasing next week. And with that said, I'm going to round this one out here. Really appreciate some support down below if you enjoyed this video. Really enjoy making these marathon videos and I'm hoping that you guys are loving them too. So any support, a sub, a like, comment, typical stuff, I'd greatly appreciate it. I want to give a massive thank you to all of my amazing patrons for all the continued support over there. As per usual, thank you all so much. And thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And I'll catch you all in the next one.